Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's event, Making the Underground Railroad. Now, you can't see the other audience members, but we had more than 1,000 RSVPs, and we're so grateful that you're all joining us. And I know you're eager to get started, but we do have a few housekeeping notes first. Closed captioning is available. You can click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom window and select Show Subtitle. Now, towards the end of our conversation, I'll be taking questions from you for our guests. You can submit them through the event Q&A uh, box on the bottom of your Zoom. And this event is being recorded and live streamed on WAMU's Facebook page. So if you're watching there, feel free to share comments or questions there as well. And we're also going to rebroadcast this conversation on, on 1A uh, next week. And a very special thank you to our sponsors, Comcast Business, DC Lottery, DC Department of Housing and Development, and University of Maryland Global Campus. And thanks again to you. So let's get started. Uh, when the novel The Underground Railroad was published in 2016, it caught the world's attention for its stark portrayal of slavery in America. It reimagines the Underground Railroad as an actual underground railroad with train tracks and stations. And we follow the journey of Cora. She's a young woman enslaved on a Georgia plantation as she travels the railroad in a bid for freedom. Now the Pulitzer Prize winning novel has been adapted into a limited TV series of the same name and it's available to stream on Amazon Prime. And I am so honored that the author of Underground Railroad, Colson Whitehead, is joining us this evening. As I said, he won the Pulitzer Prize for the Underground Railroad, and his next novel is The Nickel Boys. Colson, welcome. Hey, howdy. And we're also joined this evening by Barry Jenkins, the director and showrunner of the television adaptation, The Underground Railroad. He won an Academy Award for 2016's Moonlight, which he wrote and directed. He's also the writer and director of 2018's If Bill Street Could Talk. Barry, it's great to see you. Hey, great to see you. Thanks for having me. So I offered a very short summary um, of the plot a moment ago, but I'd be curious to hear from each of you what The Underground Railroad is about. From, from your perspective. And Colson, I'll, I'll come to you first. What won't a, a couple of lines of plot summary capture? Yeah, it's a story of, uh, of uh, a Cora. She's a, an enslaved woman on a plantation in Georgia. And I, I got the idea about 21 years ago, um, thinking about to, to how when I was a kid, I heard those words underground railroad and thought it was a real underground train until my teacher explained to me how it actually worked. But the image stayed with me. And so I was sitting on my couch one day um, in Brooklyn and I thought, wouldn't that be just a weird premise for a story um, if the metaphor was literal train? And uh, that's a premise. So I added the notion that each state that Core goes through as she runs north is a different state of American possibility. Um, it's like Gulliver's Travels or Ulysses a hero has to solve an allegorical problem before he or she can progress to the next stage. And um, uh, when I first had the idea, I was sort of you know, too scared to do it, so I put it off. And um, for about 14 years, and I figured out uh, where she'd run from, where she'd run to, run, run to. But it's really a story about becoming a person. You know, She starts off as an object, and in each state, she finds a new different notion of freedom that she tests and tests her. And uh, until finally, um, you know, she comes to some sort of place of resolution. How would you, how would you describe it, Barry? I know you've been doing it a lot the last um, three weeks. Yeah, three yeah I mean, the, the, the beauty of adaptation is you, you've already done it. And so <laughs> I, I think your description is all the description anybody needs. You know, I, I like to say I'm cheating. You know, Colson Whitehead is a MacArthur genius and uh, he wrote this story. So I just piggyback off of what he says. But yeah, I, I would agree. Um, and I think the other thing too was this idea of um, charting the story of Black people in America, but also, you know, myth building, but out of a very grounded, truthful experience. I think that's really what the book was for me. It's why I thought it could really translate to visual language. Now, Colson, you said you were afraid to write it. Uh, at first, why? I was I was thirty, which uh, by society standard is uh, actually adulthood. But I felt very immature. You know, I still went out every night, and I didn't think I was a good enough writer to pull off the um, the subject in the technical sense. 
And I think I was mature enough to write about slavery in the way it needed to be um, talked about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I finally decided to pull the trigger, I realized that I've been putting it off for so long. You know, I write other books, put out my notes and say, no, I'm not ready. That it seemed finally that um, the book I'm scared to write is the one I should be doing, which mm -hmm. sounds very self-helpy. But sometimes um, when you need to push the next kind of level in your, in your work or your life, uh, it can be, it can sound a bit self-helping. Barry, what was your experience of reading the book? Uh, it, was, it was really wonderful. You know, I have been a fan of Colson's dating back to his first novel, The Intuitionist, which, you know, took this idea of elevator inspectors, again, a very grounded sort of visual idea and spun again, this huge world of, uh, you know, set in a fictional New York. And, you know, you can talk about whether it's like Jim Crow or between Jim Crow and Antebellum, all these different things, but he took a very truthful experience and wove this really, almost like a, this like world of black Jedis built out of uh, elevator inspectors. And so when I was a kid, I had imagined the Underground Railroad um, was an actual network of trains, not even imagine, that's kind of what I saw uh, when my teacher first said the words Underground Railroad. And so just, just combining those two experiences, you know, knowing what Colson does with very grounded imagery and just hearing the conceit that he had written a book about the Underground Railroad, I kind of had an idea of what it was. And the really lovely thing was as I read it for the first time, that conceit was great. And it was like the spine of the text then there were all these other things, you know, this idea of Cora, you know, on this journey to really reconcile the sense of abandonment that she feels from her mother, just the idea of parenting uh, throughout the book and the generational legacy, you know, of these sort of like family connections. I was like, oh, this is really rich. You know, it felt like it was about the one thing. If it was only about the Underground Railroad, I don't know that the novel would be successful, but I think that railroad is kind of like the spine um, that all these different things hinge, hinge off of. And I just started seeing there's so much here, so much possibility for visual storytelling. Yeah. Well, let's play a scene from the series. Uh, here's Cora, played by Tuso Mbedu. She's talking to Royal, played by William Jackson Harper. Now, Royal helped Cora escape from the slave catcher chasing her and brought her to a Black-owned and operated farm in Indiana. And the farm is planning to vote on whether Cora can stay. I can't speak for the others, but you certainly got my vote. What ain't yours I'm worried about? That's so. Yeah, it's nice to be here, but I'm still just a runaway from Georgia. But see, you, you're not on Randall anymore, remember? You're free. How so? Ain't no way to prove it. Man lost my mom. Then me. Ain't no way he ever given up on finding me. Well, you've been gone long enough, gone far enough. Ain't no way, no harm from Georgia's gonna come to you. Not while I'm here. Land is property. Tools is property. I'm still property. Even in Indiana. Say so right here. That may be true, but this farm make enough money to buy out all the folks on that plantation and then some. Hell, I'd just as soon ride down and settle your papers myself. Why ain't y'all then? Why ain't we what? Why ain't y'all gone and bought out all them but can't escape chains? I don't know. Maybe it ain't right yet. You know, nothing lasts forever, especially for black folks. Maybe we just holding on to what we can hold on to. Protecting our own and growing all the while. Guess that make men go right about me then. I ain't one of y'all. So I hold on a me. When that vote happen, however it go, I'm honored. It ain't gonna come to that, I promise you. No. Don't promise me nothing. 
Everybody keep telling me how special I am. What good is a railroad if only special folk can take it? What good is a farm full of freedom if only special folk can till it? Barry, for people who haven't seen the series yet, um, some of the scenes from Cora's experience on this farm on Indiana, they're so, they're so joyful. They're mm -hmm. so beautiful. And yet, and, and not just because Cole said I read your book, but I also watched it with this just, it was probably the most difficult part of the series to watch because I, I watched it all with this sense of impending doom. Mm -hmm. What 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 in the the black experience and the American possibility that Colson talked about were you, were you exploring in in these scenes? Yeah, it, it's interesting because that scene is is one of the ones I'm really really proud of because we were very late in the production of this episode. And, you know, Colson has this character, there's Landers, there's Mingo and John Valentine. We kind of synthesized uh, Landers and John Valentine. And there were certain conversations that those three men were having that we couldn't find a way to really work out um, in the show. And it was just, it felt like it was really, there was something really beautiful in the possibility of Cora starting at Georgia and getting to this place where she's the one bringing these questions uh, to the farm, because she is the thing, you know, that kind of doesn't belong belong here. Um, and it, it goes back to, I think, one of the things that I really loved about the book, <laughs> you know, the conversation they have there, I, I just wrote down the word promises, you know, how many times, you know, the Civil War, Emancipation Proclamation, great, now we promise that you guys will be equal. Hell, there'll even be black men in Congress, Reconstruction. How does that work out? You know, then we get to the turn of the century and now black folks are migrating and earning property. You know, how does that work out? 1965, civil rights amendment, great, everything's beautiful now. Here we are 50 years later, how did that work out? And so it seems like there's always this wave of progress and promises and then disappointment and destruction. And I think because the railroad allows Colson to to like jump through so many periods of time, we kind of get to chart so many of those promises and broken promises. Um, and I just I just felt like there was an opportunity for for Cora to be the one to point it out. Now that she is uh, she's achieved so much so so to, so so to say uh, freedom by being in this utopic this black utopic place um, on the Indiana, Indiana farm. So yeah, I mean again, I just uh, I'm gonna keep tossing flowers at Colson's feet, because it was just, again, just working through this prism of this is how the book is functioning. And it feels like it wants to coalesce in a conversation. Colson, how were you exploring this tension between Black people who had had made it mm. and and felt like they needed to, to protect what they built and others who said, no, we need to help people like, like Cora who um, are enslaved, in this case, she's wanted for murder. Um, how were you exploring those tensions? Well, you know, that, that scene, which of course is one of the many perfect scenes of the adaptation, you know, I, I, every time I see it, I just like shake my head. I can't believe you pulled it off. And, um, you know, it's such a wonderful gift. But, um, uh, the, you know, it, it, I, I mixed and matched different arguments, different, you know, periods as, as Barry was sort of describing. And so, um, you know, there's in, a, in the Indiana section, there's a bit between uh, Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass. There's a bit, uh, you know, we're sort of alluding to re respectability pockets, re respectability politics now, like um, who can we save, who can we not save, mm -hmm. pull your pants up. If you just pulled your pants up, you know, uh, you'd get somewhere in life. And so all those echoes are sort of sort of bubbling up and down in different sections. And that's the sort of beauty of a fantastic structure. If you look at that scene, it's very grounded, it's very real. Uh, it's a cabin, uh, two people, there's nothing strange, but um, the fantastic structure uh, from state to state allows these different um, conversations that didn't happen in 1850 
happened in 65, 1865. Um, the fantastic structure allows all these different conversations to happen, you know, simultaneously. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in a realistic novel, I couldn't have done that. Uh, it's mm-hmm. only by sort of giving myself over to, um, uh, to the fantastic that we can actually get to the real. Barry, how much did that fantastic element of Coulson's work lend itself to to your work? How much freedom did it give you as as a director? I think it gave a lot of freedom, but but it wasn't uh, the the kind of visual visual freedom that you would expect um, on the surface. I think what Coulson said is true. It, it allowed the characters to evolve their thinking, their relationship to the country you know, in a much more rapid way than they would have if we're set between the, the years 1855 and 1856. Um, and so I think this, the, the way that Coulson jumps around in time, it opens, it opens the, the character's evolution up to different, different ways of thought. Because I will say, when I first heard the words Underground Railroad, I didn't think of it as a fantastical thing. And I think Coulson and I were talking very early and we said, yeah, we got to be careful that it can't become steampunk. You know, it can't be all right. these people, you know, walking around in leather chaps, you know, with, with eye patches and things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I said to my production team, I don't want anybody to levitate, you know, but I do want to sort of lean into some of the things that Coulson's done. And whether it's these okra seeds, let's take very grounded things and treat them in a sublimated, very spiritual way. Um, and so I thought it would fit very well with, uh, with what I did, because as he said uh, so eloquently, he used the fantastic to get to the real. Um, and I thought we could do the same thing. And you mentioned okra seeds. We should mention here that Cora takes okra seeds from uh, the garden uh, her mother planted when she escapes from Georgia. And, and that's something she carries with her uh, to the very end of what we see of her journey. Uh, so yeah, and it's, and it's June 3rd. So I, I have no I'm, I'm not this is this won't be a spoiler free conversation. I, I hope that was clear to people. <laughs> yeah, I can't do the mental work to, to not drop spoilers when we're talking about this. I think that's very fair. That's very fair. Colson, how closely involved were you with the adaptation? You know, we talked a few times over maybe about two years. Um, I was working on other books. I couldn't, you know, sort of hang out in the writer's room. I was working on the Nickel Boys. And some people can do many things at once. I can only do <laughs> one thing at a time. And so, um, uh, but I, was, I felt from the very beginning, uh, it was in great hands, you know, from the first talk when I was sort of interviewing Barry, which is sort of silly, um, but um, giving him permission to take it on. And then, uh, a few months later, you know, getting some of his solution to the problems of adaptation. He mentioned the three uh, characters of Lander, Valentine, and Mingo. You got to compress, you know, it's a very big cast. I'm happy to like, you know, throw in people all the time and, and make, a, make the book uh, well populated. There's an actual problem when you're making a film of it. <laughs> you know, so uh, I, have, I have different concerns. Uh, but all the solutions sounded great. And uh, so I didn't worry about it. Um, and then when I actually saw it, uh, you know, it succeeded beyond anything I could, anything I deserved and anything I could, I could imagine. So. I mean, creating this series was a huge, it was a huge task. According to the New York Times, daily production costs uh, could reach nearly $1.5 million. Uh, more than 300 people spent uh, more than, I think it was 16,000 hours building the sets that included this 15 structure plantation, more than 3,000 costumes. I mean, Barry, just from a logistical standpoint, how much of a, of a lift was this? Uh, it was uh, definitely the, the, the most difficult uh, creative task I've ever undertaken. You know, managing all those things and yet still being aware of, you know, what's, what's very real and intimate and what will be you know, very engaging for the audience, which isn't a thing at this large scale. It's usually a very small thing. For example, a, a sack of okra seeds, you know, in a, in a woman's hand. Um, it was tricky doing both those things at once, but the good thing is, you know, I've been working, you know, with all my friends who I met in film school at Florida State University 20 years ago. And I, I don't think you can do something like this. It's, this is not a singular 
kind of vision. It's a, a shared communal uh, vision amongst all the cast and crew. And so bit by bit, you know, instead of, I thought from, from the beginning, I thought, oh, I have to know exactly what's happening every moment on every one of our 116 days. And then I realized, no, no, I just need to be very clear about what's happening tomorrow. And if I just have very near focus, you know, and have a uh, tunnel vision and just look at the thing in front of me, we can eventually get through. The really wonderful thing that came out of that was by looking in this very near focused way, you know, you got these actors and these locations, you know, we started to find places where, you know, the book is doing this. And when you actually have people kind of acting out the book, you realize, oh, they did that thing that I didn't expect, you know, let's follow that. And so it was this really wonderful thing where Colson was charting this course for us, but we started to have the freedom. Well, we'll just get on this little off ramp and then we'll come right back on. Um, and I would always check in with Colson when I saw an off ramp, I'd be like, hey, is this cool? And, uh, and he would always reply to me eventually be like, you know, that's cool. The one thing that I pitched him that he didn't approve, he, that was the quickest reply I've ever gotten from you. <laughs> I mean, it was yeah, instantaneous. I, I, yeah, I sort of knew, I, I knew very quickly that. Uh, <laughs> that was not I, I, I want to know what it is now. I mean, <laughs> what well, I, mean, I, I don't, I don't want to say it now, Colson. There's two characters in the show, the two children, uh, Homer and Grace, because Grace is an invention, an invention of ours. And Colson was so kind because I've, I've always loved his first novel to let me name the character Grace after this, the side character, the intuitionist. And I thought, oh, maybe Grace and Homer were separated at birth. They were on the same auction block and Homer went with the Ridgeway and Grace went that way. And Colson was like, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> and so we didn't do it. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, but Colson, that, that leads me to believe that there's a great deal of, of trust that has to be in play when you're allowing your work to be adapted. Um, how do you know you've found the right person to trust with, with your work? Well, I mean, uh, it's, it's Barry, so it's very easy. You know, all the questions you have are answered uh, in this really, um, you know, uh, enlightened way very quickly. He's thought, he's thought about these questions before you, uh, you know, can ask them. And, um, and just each time we talked, you know, I was really reassured um, you know, the one example I always think of is the North Carolina section when Cora is in an, an attic for 60 pages. And again, in a novel, I could have her, you know, have a conversation. She can look, you know, through a hole in the wall and, and see the world. Uh, but it's very static and it's, it's too static for a film or a TV show. And so he, you know, told me his solution uh, for it. And I was like, that's genius. I should have thought of that. Darn, darn it. <laughs> okay. And then, you know, uh, when you actually when I actually saw it, there's another sort of step to that scene. Um, and and uh, he took it even even further and 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 pulled it off so beautifully. So um, um, you know, just from the, from the first conversation, he sort of had it down. I guess I, I should go through my email and see if I can find your query about the, the intuitionist. It may be before my, you know, my Gmail. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, he, you know, he, uh, he was a fan of the first book, and so mm -hmm. um, I sort of knew he sort of got the style. Mm -hmm. and, you know, both the book and the series are filled with truly horrific scenes that reflect the reality of slavery. And you know, Barry, it's it's one thing to read it on on the page, mm -hmm. and it's another to have a visual representation of it. From your director seat, how did you, how did you think about the difference between accurate portrayal mm -hmm. and fetishizing black trauma? Yeah, it was interesting. You know, I tried to use my own my own sort of like view uh, as a moral, as an ethical compass. And I, and I always had to be aware of the scene that we could make and the scene that we were making. Um, and also trying to, you know, excavate the, the scene and, and really understand like wh why we're showing and, and what we're actually unearthing. Um, you know, I, I've been quoting this, this quote um, 
that Hilton Owls uh, wrote in a review of Moonlight, where this character Little asks this character Juan a very particular question. He asks him, what's, uh, what's a pejorative? I'm not gonna say the word. And uh, uh, Hilton writes, uh, Juan unpacks the word, but he doesn't unpack the boy with it. And I felt like our task was to unpack some of these very brutal images, but not un unpack the audience or the cast and crew um, along with them. And so sometimes that was, you know, we tried to use very grounded sort of techniques. Cause I did feel like in that first episode, there's a difference between showing and telling. In the first episode, we show the brutality everywhere else, say in Tennessee, when Ridgeway is telling the story of mm -hmm. what happened to Levy and what happened to Caesar, we don't cut to those things. Instead, we go to Cora and we see the effect of the stories on her face. But in that first episode, it was important to ground the audience in what the world was to really see what our, our main character, Cora, who was giving up on everything, what she's up against and how extreme an act it takes for her to decide that she's gonna go on this journey. And so we try to use very grounded techniques. For example, you know, the instances of the first uh, scene where someone's whipped, you know, it could have taken place in a day, we had to take place at night and we filmed it in an extremely wide shot. Um, and I made sure on the day that we filmed it as wide as possible to begin with. So I could see, so what does this feel like? And right away after the first take, I said, oh, this is enough. Mm. We don't need to get any closer than this. I don't need a close up on this person yelling out in pain to communicate that this is painful. And then I wanted to go one step further. You know, we've seen this acute trauma, but you know, what does, what can the show excavate about communal trauma? And so we go from the wide shot that's framing Cora and the young boy Chester, and we pan off of them. We leave the acute trauma and we land with the enslaved who are forced to watch. And so I was trying to always, you know, unpack my motives, you know, unpack what I'm showing to the audience and then really dig in and go, okay, what else about this moment can I say to hopefully reflect, you know, on our present day, you know, how it's not just about these people that we see on these videos, you know, being attacked and being aggrieved, this thing affects everyone, um, all of us, especially the folks who have to bear witness. And so it was always working through that. The sequence with Big Anthony, oh, it was so tough. That's the hardest thing I've, I've ever had to do. Um, and, and yet, you know, I felt like it was important because A, these things happened. You know, Colson did a ton of research uh, that he shared with me. I did research and many worse things than those things depicted in the show actually happened. And yet we never, we never are forced to or allow ourselves to either empathize or really identify with the people who are the victims of this brutality. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it was an opportunity uh, to do that. And I had a duty to do that. And so Big Anthony has some very particular lines um, in the moment of this happening. And then we go one step further and we force, I'll say the audience to literally inhabit him, you know, in the moment of this happening, just so we can see that this thing isn't just happening in a vacuum, you know, we see you, Big Anthony sees you. So he was always trying to think, you know, there's 116 days, on those days, I had to think for 60 days, you know, and the other, the other uh, days, you know, the other 115 days suffered because of it, but these days were so important. And were you your own gut check or did you have people who who helped you through that process uh, i was my own gut check mm -hmm. um i kind of had to be um there's just there's no way to make a show like this and and not have the burden rest uh with you um now we had this this crew was filled with people who i've known for 20 years yeah. um and is also thankfully filled um we had an intimacy coordinator and we had a, a guidance counselor uh, a therapist on set and so, and the actors themselves were empowered as well to really, everybody had the right to say, this is either too much for me, or I think this is too much for the audience or too much for the scene, et cetera and so forth. But um, I, I feel like I had to be my own compass. Well, let's play another scene from the series. Uh, the slave catcher, Ridgeway, played by Joel Edgerton, is in a pub with his young Black assistant, Homer, played by Chase Dillon, and they'd recently recaptured Cora, who's sitting nearby in chairs. Let's watch. Homer, manifest destiny. Manifest destiny. Taking what is rightfully yours, your property, whatever you deem it to be, sir. So. And all the others taking that places so that you could do such taking. 
Very good, Homer. Thank you, sir. Very good. And whether it be the, the red man or the African or the, or the Mexican, giving up themselves, giving up themselves, so that we can have what is rightfully ours. You know, the French set inside their territorial claim, or the English and Spanish speak the way. Now, my father liked his Indian talk, the uh, great spirit. The only spirit worth its salt is the American spirit, the one that called us up from the old world to the new, to conquer and build the civilized. Lift up the lesser race. We will, if not lift up, subjugate. And if not subjugate, exterminate, eliminate our destiny, a divine prescription. The American imperative. Colson, one, one of the um, really fascinating characters in both the book and the series is is Homer, this young black child who uh, stays with Ridgeway, um, helps him captured, escaped enslaved people. I explain a little bit more about that character and, and what he represents for you. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I guess in, the, in my, pre this book was a big sort of jump forward, you know, for me, I think creatively. And I think in books past, I would have over explained Homer's backstory um, and some people do have very you know, lengthy backstories in, in, the, in the novel and in the series. But my rule with Homer was that Homer is going to Homer, and whatever he wanted to do, I was going to let him do. And so, you know, that, that dynamic between Homer and Ridgeway, you know, it's just trying to catch a glimpse of, you know, the very odd dynamic between uh, the master and the enslaved. There are people who were slaves, and when they were emancipated, stayed on their farms. They knew nothing. Um, and, uh, you know, started working for their, their former master. Um, how, you know, 150 years later, how do we wrap our heads around that? And there are, there are slave masters who are like, oh, Bessie, the house slave was like a mother to me, you know, mm -hmm. obviously Bessie's not like your mother and she's uh, a piece of property to you. And so in that in sort of shifting relationship between Homer and Ridgeway, I wanted to get that kind of elusive, um, unspeakable, unknowable contract um, between the slaver and, and the enslaved. And, and Barry, uh, the, the young man who plays that role is just, I mean, he's just incredible the way he inhabits that role. Um, but something about seeing the visualization of, of Homer, a visual representation of him as he, he moves through this world. And it, and it wasn't something I experienced as much in reading the book, but the precariousness of, mm -hmm. of his life, because his safety is dependent upon his proximity to Ridge, Ridgeway and, and his whiteness and the protection that affords him. How, how did you think about that character? Um, exactly the way you just framed it. <laughs> uh, exactly the way you just framed it. I've done, I've done a lot of these Q&As and nobody's framed it as well as you did just then. Um, I think that's exactly it. On, on set, on set, um, you know, it was interesting. Joel Edgerton, who plays Ridgeway, is also a director. Um, and when you're dealing with, you know, an actor as young as Chase, who was 10 years old at the time of filming, wow. their scene partner is oftentimes they're in the flow helping you um, direct the, the other actor through the scene or guide them through the scene. And for me, there's something, and you know, Chase is new. And so he's looking up to Joel. And so there's a real thing happening between them and the making of the show um, that fortunately or unfortunately feels very real, you know, in the presentation of these two characters. Um, it's a very, dark, seductive uh, relationship because you can sort of project out 30 years from now or 40 years from now, you know, if somehow in reconstruction, you know, Homer has managed to slip his way, you know, into some governorship or mayorship or, you know, into the halls of Congress and the House of Representatives, what is he going to do? Like, what is he going to do? And uh, I thought it was, you know, one of Black Holton answered the, the question first, because this is the one I always, I, I've said very publicly, you know, I wanted to fight Colson over this character because he's such <laughs> an enigma and such a 
very complex thing to, to deal with. But for me, in telling the story of Ridgeway as a, as, a, as a child, as a teenager, and seeing the way his father interacted, you know, with, uh, with freed men and women or the formerly enslaved, there was something about that connection. I felt like that was, that was at the, somewhere in the subtext of whatever his affinity for Homer was, but it wasn't a father-son relationship to me. It was indoctrination, it was grooming. It was like this proximity um, and almost to the sense that maybe because he knows Homer so well and makes him a better slave catcher. I don't know. It's not anything that I could ever figure out and write a thesis paper on. Yeah. I just knew moment to moment, scene to scene, there was something happening between the two of them that Homer didn't quite understand, but allowed himself to participate in. And that Ridgeway, of course, is absolutely in control of. Um, it's why the scene where he gives him the keys, you know, is so important. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, Colson, I'm, st I'm still upset with you. <laughs> <laughs> Although he's a very popular character in the series. I mean, people people hate him, but they love him. Um, he has his eyes. He has like, this criminal intelligence that's like 90 years old. It's always like, just, like yeah. you know, and it's, it's creepy and it's stirring, you know. Yeah, Chase did a really wonderful job with it. And, and you did a wonderful job drawing him, but, uh, but never again, never again. <laughs> You know, Colson, one of the, the things the book and, and Barry, I think the series both do so well is show very plainly how slavery, it, it's not just about what happened to the enslaved. Mm -hmm. It's about how it warps everything and everyone mm -hmm. around it who participates in that system. Uh, Colson, I'll come to you first. How were you exploring that in the novel? And then Barry, I'd love to hear how you thought about it in, in the adaptation. Well, it was, it was a national disease. Um, you know, it was one thing to have this abstract idea, like what if it's a real railroad? Another thing to actually understand, try to understand how slavery worked as a, as a grown up, as opposed to like a kid watching Roots. And doing the research, you just see how it touched everybody. It touched the people in the North, it touched everyone in the South. Um, you know, there are runaway slave ads that I inserted in the book. And so there's a guy in a newspaper who has the shtick of describing runaway, runaway slaves, uh, their scars, their expressions, where they're last seen. And, and so this aspiring journalist is propping up the institution. Um, uh, towns are coming into being because uh, uh, because of the wheels of capitalism. And a blacksmith is not just making, um, you know, farming tools, they're making the iron rims for the wagons that take the cotton to market, the nails for all the, all the towns that are sprouting up. And so, um, so America comes into being through uh, this merging between capitalism and, and slavery. And once I got sort of wrapped my head around that, you know, I, I try to find different characters who can embody that. So, Ridgeway's father is a blacksmith, and I can sort of talk about the role of, of, of iron in the system. Mm -hmm. But it touches everyone. And you know, there's a character named Ethel who's uh, uh, reluctantly drawn into the drama of, of the Underground Railroad. And I think she's emblematic of, of a lot of people who um, don't care about slavery either way, you know, the same way that maybe we're not thinking about Syria every day or different wars around the world. Mm -hmm. Um, they're not pro-slavery, not, not anti-slavery, just sort of indifferent and wrapped up in their own sort of um, uh, daily drama. Um, and so even if you're on the sidelines, it's still you know, the, defining character, the defining conversation of the nation. No, Barry, when I think about the series, my mind automatically goes to a moment where someone's hatred um, sparks a flame, if you will, that literally burns a town down. Mm -hmm. and, and so how are you thinking about that, that warping of, of white people who mm -hmm. were a part of the system or who conversely said, you know, we don't want any parts of it. This isn't our problem. Just keep, keep all of them away from us. How are you thinking about that? Yeah, it was it was tricky because you know I I I didn't I didn't want to create a show or create this through line where the show was about this idea that 
hatred implicates us all. You know, it's like, no, the, the people who suffered the most in this were enslaved Africans, undoubtedly. Um, and yet I love what Colson did in creating the, the North Carolina world, um, which there's a runner in the, in the book that we kind of touch on with the Irish being brought in yeah. to replace um, the black folks, um, which is uh, rooted in a very particular aspect of American history. Um, but then it was, it was, as you sort of like pitched in the, in the question, it was clear to me that this town itself and the town we found to, to set this in, because it's one thing to read, but then visually to see it, it's, it's literally closed off. It's a complete ring, a complete circle, you know, with all this energy focused on this place of death and the center. And yeah, it was clear to us that there is no, there's nothing can come from this, but, but hate begetting more hate begetting more hate. And uh, it was cool because we had created this character, Grace Fanny Briggs, and I, I, I knew that Cora needed to leave her behind to learn the, 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 the story of the notion of sacrifice that eventually we learn, um, you know, Mabel was sacrificing for everyone. Mm -hmm. She had to leave the little girl behind, but I felt like I couldn't bring this character into Colson's narrative and then leave her behind uh, to burn to death, to burn to death. I was like, no, we have to get her out. And it was like, organically, well, how does that happen? Well, this town is just full of hate. And thankfully, just pure luck, it's a, a town built of nothing but wooden structures. And so Mark Freeberg, our production designer, who I should say, you played that clip uh, from the saloon, that's a set. And Mark built that from the ground up. That's why it looks the, the light and the candles, all those things, even the outhouse is actually out back, like on that set. Um, but I was talking to Mark about well, what can we do to destroy this place? And you know, Mark Freeberg, he just he just knows everything about history. He goes, Well, a town like this, if one window catches the catch fire, the whole thing's gonna go up. Right. And I thought, oh. And then I went to James, I was like, okay, we are going to burn this town to the ground. Because in a way, I think, and, and maybe Colson can speak to this, but you know, and by jumping through all these different periods in history and seeing how this hate keeps manifesting itself and ruining the lives of all these folks, and now here we are, 2021, some of the same hate is still with us, especially over the last four years, it's just systematically been undoing, you know, all these very tenuous bonds we've been building. Not that I'm saying the episode is about, you know, America burning to, to the ground because of its own self-propelled uh, uh, hatred, but in that sense, such a small community, there was no other place for that animus to go. Um, and yeah, and we actually end with, you know, Fiona, you know, sitting at the altar. And it's like, yeah, look at where this hate got you. You know, look at where it's gotten us all. Mm. Um, but Colson did that. I just, I, just, I, just, I just took the baton. It's all Colson. <laughs> Well, I want to turn to some questions uh, from our attendees. Uh, Louise asks, the music, both ambient and composed, is haunting. Please talk about that aspect of the series. Barry? Uh, yeah, Nicholas Patel, our, um, the composer on uh, this, of Bill Street Could Talk and Moonlight, um, just did a really wonderful job because of the, the pandemic. Um, Nick actually moved to LA to create the score for, uh, for the show. Typically he's in New York and I'm in LA and it was great. We had this little testing bubble. And so we would go from the edit and then 10 minutes uh, drive, I'd be at Nick's studio. And then 10 minutes drive, I'd be at the mix stage. And so it was this really wonderful process where they could be a sound uh, an ambient sound on the mix stage. And I could send it to Nick, get in the car go to the studio with him and we could then be scoring in the key, you know, of a sound from the environment. Um, it was a really very involved and fluid process. And the, the beauty of that was in the writer's room for the show, you know, shout out the writers, uh, Jackie Hoyt, uh, Jihan Crowther, Allison Davis, Adrian Rush, and Nathan C. Parker, son of the British director, the late British director, Alan Parker. We were trying to unpack this book. We had this rule, we can't call Colson about shit that we can figure out ourselves. And so we kept trying to come up 
with a working mythology for ourselves of why does South Carolina look the way it does? Mm -hmm. You know, why does North Carolina look the way it does? And he gives us an Easter egg in the first chapter when the station agent says, oh, there's two trains. One's going this way, one's going that way. You know, you won't know which way it's going until you get on it. But you're like, oh, if she got on the other train, she wouldn't end up in South Carolina or she'd end up in South Carolina, but it'd be a different South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So we thought, oh, Cora's manifesting, you know, these states. She gets to North Carolina, it's damned because she doesn't want to leave the things in South Carolina behind. And because of that, I was like, oh, Nick, the, the score every time she gets to a new state it's got to be a manifestation of the world around Cora. And so, yeah, it was really cool. And it was, this, again, this lovely process of what's in the environment because you couldn't record music in this time period and how can that become music? You also make this decision at the end of each episode to sort of jolt us back to the present mm -hmm. with, with a modern song. Mm -hmm. Talk about the, the song choices there. Yeah, it was a mixture of therapy for the audience because, uh, you know, it's a very immersive journey. And it's important to realize you were watching this in 2021, you know, not in 1855. And I thought dropping a, cont a contemporary needle drop only at the end of episodes, never in the middle, it would help underscore that point. But the, the, the way it started was at the end of the first Indiana chapter, you know, Cora has just said goodbye to her greatest love and Caesar, and then she's walking into Royal's cabin and it's like a heartache. It's just like pure, pure heartache. And as she was walking out of the door, we were in the edit, I started to hear the phone ring uh, because this song from Groove Theory was very popular when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, it's so weird that there's a phone ringing right now, but here's this woman, this black woman in 1995 singing directly to the heartache that my main character is experiencing in 1855. You know, how is that possible? There's legacy, there's lineage, there's a spiritual connection. And I thought, oh, this is great. And then we just started chasing it. You know, it actually became a, a fun gambit and post to figure out what's the best song to end each of these episodes. Well, if I can add, you know, when I work, I play like a, a 3000 song playlist. And um, uh, you know, I was watching the first episode with my wife and we were so moved, like he, he really broke the code. And then Outcast B.O.B. comes on and I've been playing that I played it a hundred times and I was writing the book. It's in the awesome. book and, and somehow you got it. And then Claire de Lune came on in, cha in, in uh, chapter nine. Mm -hmm. And my wife was like, did you tell Barry that Claire de Lune is on your playlist and you play it all the time? And I was like, no, it's just sort of in there. And so you picked up on all these, uh, the soundtrack of, you know, when I was writing the book. Well, we, we dug deep, man. We, we like to say we got inside your brain. <laughs> Well, Michelle wants to get inside your brain, Colson. Um, she writes, as a Black woman, I find the character of Cora so profound in telling a story about us that's rarely found in books or on the screen. How and why did you choose her as the protagonist? If you had the story in your mind 20 years ago, you were way ahead of the times. So how, how did you choose Cora as, as your protagonist? Yeah, well, I think you have to mix it up. You know, I'm, I'm supposed to inhabit different kinds of people uh, for my main characters. And um, my first novel has a female protagonist. Uh, it just seems, it seems very natural to me. In terms of, of this book, um, one of the slave narratives I read very early was Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, Harriet Jacobs. And she writes very movingly about the dilemma of a female slave. When um, a slave girl becomes an enslaved woman, she enters into a new, more terrible form of slavery. She's now sort of subject to her master's sexual desires if she wasn't already. She's supposed to have a lot of babies because babies are money or property. Um, so it's a different dilemma than faces a male slave. And I just seem to pay homage to Harriet Jacobs uh, to explore this different dynamic. Um, I want to test myself as a writer, do different characters I haven't done before. And I just had a, a bunch of male protagonists in a row and uh, in previous books. And so a voice in the back of my head was saying, you know, don't do the same crap all the time, Colson mix it up. So it's practical, it's pushing myself and then trying to um, uh, explore a different aspect of, 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 of slavery. Well, Barry, we got this question um, because as we know, your film, If Bill Street Could Talk, is also an adaptation. In that case, it's a novel by James Baldwin. And Dylan asks, how did adapting Colson Whitehead differ from adapting James Baldwin? Oh, the, the, the biggest thing was, you know, Mr. Baldwin, unfortunately, is not with us. And so I couldn't bounce, bounce things off of him. 
Um, and so I felt the I felt the necessity to to to, to not alter the text, um, you know, because I couldn't be in dialogue uh, with him to to check on you know where those, what those alterations would mean, um, with the exception of the ending, which eventually, very late in the process, I decided I had to amend. In this case, you know, Colson's here, um, and so I could always check in with him, you know, and it was great because. We sent Colson, we call it like the Bible or the format for the show before we even began writing the scripts. And, you know, he didn't go, this is terrible. You can't do this. And so there was always this, uh, this sense of trust, but in that trust, there was also freedom. Um, and so, yeah, it was really one, you know, Colson's been very clear about saying, oh, I wasn't that involved and this and that. But, um, but uh, I felt like he was completely involved because if there was something that I had doubts about or questions about, I would ping him and send off. And I think just knowing that that, that the possibility was there, it really freed us, you know, say myself and the actors and everyone to really just be open about what was possible. Well, here's a couple of questions we got. Beatrice asks, why did you feel the need to create a backstory for Ridgeway as a boy? And another attendee asks, why focus extensively on Ridgeway's story during the middle of the series? I found myself being resistant to caring about him. I'm a black person. Um, Barry, your thoughts? uh, yeah, I think uh, I think you should be resistant to caring for them. Um, you know, I wasn't afraid to. Typically, when evil arrives at our doorstep, we just accept it as implicitly evil. And I think because we don't look beneath and see what the root of that evil is, you know, where it comes from, we maybe aren't able to spot it in other places. You know, before it actually metastasizes uh, and forms. Um, I wasn't afraid to go into the backstory of this character. And to be honest, the flashback to me is less about him. You know, it's more about this organizing principle um, of the great spirit, which is something Colson wrote into the book that I was fascinated by. Um, The other aspect of it too is the second of those three episodes to me is not about Ridgeway at all. You know, it's about Jasper Mm -hmm. and the journey that Jasper and Cora um, go on. It's really interesting. Ridgeway kind of is a side character in his own narrative. The only reason they're going to Tennessee is they need to go see his father. And yet, you know, he doesn't have any power in that episode. I feel like Jasper has all the power. The other thing that was really interesting to me was, and it's difficult to tell, but I think this is realistic, you know, Cora is a very young person. You know, she's maybe 16, 17, 18 for the majority of our narrative. But because of the lives these folks live, the years just weigh much more heavily on them. So in that flashback, The Great Spirit, Ridgeway is essentially the same age that Cora is in the main story. Yeah, look at how different the world is for the two of them. You know, I thought showing those two things in opposition to each other, actually not in opposition, just presenting them because I'm not making any judgments. I think it makes it very clear the world is very hard on these folks and not so hard on those folks. Yeah. You know, for example, we've been referring to, and Richard refers to it as, you know, Cora's warrant for the murder of a child. And yet if that happened today, we would say, oh, it was the standard ground law. You know, but laws like that have rarely or have ever applied to someone uh, of a character like Cora. Um, and so I think all these different things to me were very interesting to explore. And I, and I felt like going into more of the text of Ridgeway, it didn't decenter our leads because that second episode, which Tennessee was meant to be one episode when we filmed it, whoever asked the question, mm-hmm. uh, but the actor Calvin Leon Smith who plays Jasper did such a great job that he began to take that episode he literally reoriented how we filmed it, the pace we filmed it at, so that we got in post and realized, oh, there's an entire Jasper episode here. Yeah. I'm kind of proud of it because we saved a lot of money. We filmed two episodes in the time <laughs> it took to film one, but only because this character, just the strength, the power, yeah. the dignity of Jasper was so large, it just overwhelmed everything else. And so I don't think it was three Ridgeway episodes. I think of it as maybe one and a half, because that second was all about Jasper. We have time for just a couple of other questions, and and I wanted to make sure to ask you about these shots that are interspersed through the yeah. series of enslaved Black characters who have died. In, in some instances, they're alive, but they're standing still. They're gazing at the camera. What were those moments about? What were you saying? Yeah, uh, some of it was just, uh, I mean, they, they happen on instinct often when we're on these sets. And They happened quite often on this set because there were so many really wonderful people, our advisors on the ground, Mr. and Mrs. King, Miss Wendy, uh, all of whom appear throughout the show, uh, not main characters, but all uh, who appear. 
there were these civil war reenactors, these primarily white men, who they preserve all these muskets and these uniforms. They go to Gettysburg and reenact these battles. There are also black folks in the deep South who preserve those, those traditions. And when someone like me comes down to make a film, they embed you know, with our cast and our crew and particularly our background actors. And so we filmed this show entirely in the state of Georgia. I'm walking on these plantations. Mark Freeberg, our production designer, rebuilt the, the slave quarter on this plantation because of course that had been allowed to uh, erode, but the plantation house was still there. And so there were moments where I realized I was walking by my ancestors. I mean, I was just literally just seeing them fully embodied. And I felt like it was an opportunity to, uh, to, to capture their portrait, you know, to look at them and in a way allow them uh, to look at us. And so it would just randomly happen. And, and as we were going through the show, the one thing I knew was when Quora stands over, I'll just say him, I won't spoil it. When Quora stands over him and points at that thing, we're gonna see so many of these faces. And that's when I realized maybe I'm gathering for that purpose. Um, but then I also started to think there are just so many of these folks who we haven't had the opportunity to see. Yeah. And, you know, Colson did one kind of seeing and creating the book. I was doing this other seeing and adapting it to the screen. And then with this crew and this set, all these resources, there's an opportunity to do this third kind of seeing, uh, which is these portraits. And it was just lovely that some of them made it into the show. Mm. We should mention that you've also uh, released a 52 minute film of those images uh, called The Gaze. Um, mm -hmm. So I encourage people to check that out. Yeah, and, 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 Jen, and Jen, I'll say one more thing to that. There's, there's this young man who was killed by the police who didn't get as much publicity as everyone else, but I've always thought of him. This, this man named John Crawford, who was in a Walmart uh, shopping. Mm -hmm. He was shopping and he was on the phone. He had like a, an, uh, an air rifle or something. And it's an open carry state. And all I've ever seen of him was the surveillance video uh, where he is shot down by the police. And I've always wanted to, I just, I just always wanted to see him. Mm -hmm. And this is maybe five, 10 years ago. Um, and I just think of all these people um, from our past, all our ancestors who we've never been allowed to see. And so there was just something in the, 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 the essence of all of that that I thought, oh, it's worth not filming a shot for the actual show right now to pause all this machinery to just see these people. Yeah. Well, I want to wrap on this question from Tony who asks, what are we to believe happens to Cora as she goes on? Is she safe now? Will she find a place for herself? Uh, so Cole said, I don't know how how you think about Cora's journey, or I, I don't think you're probably interested in, in projecting, you know, what we should think about it, but I am curious how you imagine Cora yeah, past I mean, the last page of the book. Yeah, I mean, um, no matter where she ends up, she's in Canada, has a family, uh, moves to San Francisco, wins the lottery as a rich woman. Um, she's still a black woman in 1850s America, an incredibly racist place. And so um, the story doesn't end in whatever harbor, uh, safe harbor she finds, if she finds one, uh, because our story hasn't ended. Yeah. Mary, what about for you? Uh, I agree. I think it's as hopeful, you know, as it, as it can be. You know, it's, it's what's, so many things that have happened over the last five years in this country, to say nothing over the last 50 years, you know, as black people, you know, and as Pulitzer Prize, Academy Award, uh, there was a, someone broke into my garage recently and I had to file a police report to, in order to get, uh, claim the assurance of the things that were taken, a few very nice things. And I finally got through and the sun had gone down. It was like, oh, we have to send someone out to file a police report. And I really had to think and go, oh, you know what? I'll do it tomorrow. And this is in 2021, and here's our character going off into the sunset, you know, circa 1855. And so I think she's as safe as she can be, but she broke the cycle. She went back and she got that girl. And I think that's what's most important. And she planted those seeds, the person coming behind her, there will be some sustenance when they come out and reach the top of that hill. 
Well, I want to give my thanks to Colson Whitehead, the author of many novels, including The Underground Railroad and The Nickel Boys, both of which he won Pulitzer Prizes for, and Barry Jenkins. He's Jenkins. He's the showrunner and director of the limited series, The Underground Railroad. It's available to watch now on Amazon Prime Video. Colson, Barry, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, our pleasure for sure. And thank you for participating in this evening's event. We hope you'll take a minute to fill out the survey. It will appear on your screen and it'll help us improve our virtual events uh, in the future. And we also like to say a special thank you once more to our sponsors for this event, Comcast Business, DC Lottery, DC Department of Housing and Development, and University of Maryland Global Campus. And thank you. Your support makes these events possible. So if you've never supported WAMU, please consider making a donation to support other events. This evening's event was produced by 1A producer Avery Kleinman with production and coordination support from Yanlin Chang. That's it, everyone. Thanks so much and have a great night.